Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 37. The Graces. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last time we looked at the latest in a series of royal commissions into the Irish plantations. The commission drew on the experiences of both the New English, who dominated the royal government and administered most of the plantations, and who were mostly Protestant, and the Anglo-Irish, the increasingly Gaelicised and largely Catholic nobility, who had, a century earlier, been the ruling class, and who were chafing under their much restricted political freedoms. The New English on the commission were split between undertakers and servitors of the plantations, and both factions blamed the other for the failures of the plantation policy. The servitors complained that the undertakers were not meeting their obligations, and urged them to be fined and their lands confiscated, to be granted to servitors who would do the job properly. The undertakers, in turn, complained about the vulture-like servitors exaggerating the problems, and argued that if they were just allowed to continue their plantations, their obligations would be met in time. The Anglo-Irish, as well as the Gaelic-Irish, who were consulted, urged the Commission to prevent any further plantation, and in this found allies in the parliamentary reformers, who wanted the job done properly in the plantations which already existed. The report of the commission, invaluable as it is to historians, was suppressed upon its completion. Too many important people looked too negative for it to be debated in Parliament, and the international situation required the Irish administration to remain peaceful and stable. Reform, in whichever direction, would lead to unrest, and if there was one thing the government in London didn't want, It was a rebellion in Ireland. Who knows what kind of problems something like that could cause. The report did lead to the replacement of the Lord Deputy, St. John, who had been tarnished by the report, and regardless had been in the position for a good few years now. His successor as Lord Deputy would be Henry Carey, Viscount Falkland. He had a long and distinguished career, which included military service in the Nine Years' War, when he was knighted in 1599. In 1604, he was captured at the Siege of Ostend by the Spanish, one of the final events of the Anglo-Spanish War, and safely ransomed home. This was just the start of his financial woes, as his release came at significant cost for his family. After being introduced at court, he became a gentleman of the bedchamber until 1617, when he paid £5,000 to become the comptroller of the household, a perfectly normal exchange in the cash-strapped Stuart court. I don't know whether he paid this directly to James, or to Villiers, or to someone else, but I would imagine that the bulk of it went to the rising Buckingham. Buckingham would ensure his appointment as Lord Deputy in later years, so it is possible that he was already his patron. In 1620, he became Viscount Falkland, and so we will refer to him as Falkland from here on out. Falkland, by the time he arrived in Ireland, was still heavily in debt, and by the time he got to Dublin in 1622, his wife had had to mortgage her jointure, her security, in the event that her husband predeceased her. So, Falkland's in a bit of a hole, financially speaking. However, now he was the most powerful person in an entire kingdom, on paper at least. Surely he could pull himself up by his bootstraps and ruthlessly wring every penny out of Ireland, restore his financial situation, and maybe even get back into the good graces of his father-in-law, who had, after all, disowned him for his financial mismanagement. Falkland was welcomed by many new English who resented the meddling of the Lord Treasurer, the Earl of Middlesex, who was understandably trying to reduce the cost of Irish government. 
with Buckingham clearly backing the new Lord Deputy, Falkland was willing to push the boundaries of Gaelic and Anglo-Irish patience. Those lords who opposed the Dublin government were, quote, like nettles, that sting being gently handled, but sting not being crushed. Falkland renewed the persecution of Catholics, expelling Catholic priests in a proclamation in January 1623, and instituting further punishments for recusancy. Falkland didn't discriminate on religious grounds when it came to profit, however, and was more than willing to strike at Protestants when needed. He made enemies among the New English, including other patrons of Buckingham, and allowed an investigation of the Ulster plantations which had been managed by London companies. As we've already seen, many of these plantations had not followed the conditions laid out in their charters. However, Falkland had to contend with his patron, the Duke of Buckingham. Buckingham also wanted to get something out of this arrangement. Much like under St. John, the Duke had allies and clients to reward, plus not a little bit of personal aggrandizement. And aggrandize he did. Through both St. John and Falkland, he acquired tens of thousands of acres of the best land that could be bought, coerced, or stolen. Falkland had to make do with much less, and patron and client squabbled over various incomes. Not just land, but as Lord Admiral, Buckingham also claimed a cut of Ireland's customs duties and admiralty prizes. The cash-strapped Falkland naturally wanted to keep as much of these as he could, though Buckingham usually won in these disputes. With the death of James the three Stuart kingdoms went to war with Spain. We've already covered the English side of this war in detail, and we'll be looking at the Scottish element in the future. In Ireland, the government's question was the same as it had been 20 years previously. How do we secure Ireland from Spanish invasion? Ireland remained a hole in the defences of the British Isles, and the fear was that the Nine Years' War would repeat. Spanish gold would stir rebellion, and Spanish troops could land unmolested. The religious element that these would be Catholic soldiers supported by Catholic subjects was central to this fear. The cost of improving the defence of Ireland, which included increasing the number of men under arms as well as constructing, renovating and maintaining new fortifications, would be nearly £40,000 a year. Charles's Privy Council met in September 1625 at Southampton, and here it was agreed that Old English, the Anglo-Irish, would be recruited into the trained bands, the militia, which acted as the only substantial standing military force. These were the forces overseen by the Lord Lieutenants, which we discussed a few months ago, who often took their responsibilities mm, lightly. Yet, with war now declared, they were needed. And because of the reasons I just mentioned, the question of Ireland's defence was particularly pressing. The Union of Arms, where the Anglo Irish volunteered to recruit and pay for Ireland's defence, would allow the Old English to prove their loyalty despite their mistreatment, as well as display to all, Catholics and Protestants alike, that the Crown trusted them. Charles would also avoid a significant expense, which was a major plus. He had, after all, inherited a cash-strapped treasury from his father, and would face his own financial difficulties in due course. If one of his three kingdoms could be self-sufficient in its defence, so much the better. So, the English Privy Council agreed that the Anglo-Irish would be allowed to serve in their own defence, and immediately its Irish counterpart objected. Dublin complained, quote, Thereby we should have put arms into their hands, of whose hearts we rest not well assured. End quote. These were Catholics, they couldn't be trusted. The Dublin administration had spent the last 20 years trying to wrench weapons out of Catholic hands, and now they were supposed to, what, just hand them back? As Conrad Russell puts it, in other words, they saw it as their task to defend Ireland against Papists, not by them. 
Instead, proposals were made where, in return for political and religious concessions, the Anglo-Irish would provide a voluntary tax which would pay for increasing the existing army. Negotiations began with the Anglo-Irish nobility, who were still members of the Irish House of Lords. In 1627, the Crown offered to suspend recusancy fines, remove religious restrictions on inheritance, allow the Anglo-Irish to attain public office once again, and return their ability to practice law, among other benefits. Public office required the holder to take the Oath of Supremacy, which acknowledged the king as the supreme governor of the church, something of an obstacle to devout Catholics. Instead, a secular Oath of Allegiance would take its place, bypassing this thorny theological issue. The Church of Ireland, with its leading light of James Usher, the Archbishop of Armagh, naturally protested the removal of recusancy fines and the compromise of the Oath of Allegiance. They were meant to incentivize Catholics to conform to the true faith and save their eternal souls. Suspending them for base political and financial reasons was obscene, and Usher charged Charles with trying to sell Christ for 30 pieces of silver. These proposals also faced a cold reception by the Anglo-Irish. This wasn't what they'd offered. They'd pledged to defend Ireland themselves, and so prove their loyalty and show that the Crown trusted them. For the government to shift gear, to ask them to have no role in the defence of the kingdom aside from pay the Protestant soldiers, just confirmed that they weren't trusted. Their response made sense, because they weren't trusted. Falkland, who had been an enthusiastic persecutor of Catholic priests and laity, had serious doubts as to the loyalty of the Anglo-Irish. The reversal of royal policy, from persecution to tenuous toleration, had damaged his political authority. It certainly didn't help matters when his wife publicly converted to Catholicism. After the icy response to Dublin's proposals, the negotiations were transferred to London. Eleven provincial representatives, along with three new English and eight representatives of the Anglo-Irish, finally came to an agreement in May 1628. The agreed concessions have gone down in history as the Graces. Professor Aidan Clark argues that these final terms show how the last three years of negotiations had thoroughly altered the Anglo-Irish expectations. The government, whether in Ireland or England, would not trust them. This much was clear. The most they could wish for was to limit the damage that this distrust could cause. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical, my two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A B B E L dot com code Recorded History. Babbel language for life. 
The greatest hope and aim of the Anglo-Irish, according to Russell, was an Irish version of the Concealment Act of 1624. This was a law that stipulated that, after 60 years of possession, the holder of the land would gain a valid title which could stand against royal claims to the territory. This was a valuable reform in England, but in an Irish context it would be revolutionary. The Dublin administration had been ruthless in its search for so-called concealed lands, lands which had no documentary evidence to legitimise a landowner's claim. This was incredibly common in all three of the Stuart kingdoms, but none more so than in Ireland. Finding and seizing this territory killed three birds with one stone. It directly weakened the Catholic gentry and aristocracy. It opened up new avenues for plantation, and these plantations would naturally go to the new English who dominated the Dublin government. If the Catholic Irish, both Anglo and Gaelic, could achieve the benefits of the Concealment Act, it would provide security to their holdings, block the most common cause for new plantations, and secure Catholicism in Ireland. The Graces included this concession. The Crown would renounce all claims to land which were older than 60 years, the same as the Concealment Act. In addition, special complementary concessions protected titles in Counties Clare and Connacht. There were 51 Graces in total. In return for these Acts of Grace, Charles would receive 160,000 Irish pounds over three years, which would pay for an army of 5,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. By now, negotiations had been underway for years, and the Stuart kingdoms were by this point at war with both Spain and France. With the agreements seemingly made, the Old English agreed to collect the required funds immediately while the Irish Parliament was summoned to enact the bills. This act of good faith backfired. With the ball back in Falkland's court, he bungled it. Due to Poyning's Law, the statute which made the Irish Parliament subservient to the English, there was a particular order to how Parliament was to be summoned and legislation passed. Through either design or a genuine accident, this procedure was not followed. The Irish Parliament was summoned, incorrectly, and so it couldn't sit. The money continued to be paid, because apparently to do otherwise would mean the soldiers would be billeted in Anglo-Irish homes, and because the majority of the Graces didn't need legislation to take effect. Surely, if the money was provided, the deal would be upheld, right? Right. While this administrative error was being put right, foreign prospects improved significantly. Peace with France was on the horizon, as was peace with Spain. The necessity which had spurred the graces in the first place lessened, and soon the old Protestant agenda returned in force. The Dublin government had always been reluctant to follow the new royal policy, and found willing allies in the Irish Parliament that eventually met. If you recall, James had gerrymandered the constituencies of Parliament to ensure a narrow Protestant majority. Now it worked against his son. As the Anglo-Irish gradually lost their greatest bargaining chip, royal pressure relented, and Protestant opposition blocked the passage of the Graces. They had been agreed by the King, and many of them didn't need to become law to take effect. Yet the change in circumstances meant that the Graces, as Dr. Sean Kelsey puts it, remained in discretionary limbo, largely unenforced and wholly unenforceable. The Dublin government didn't want to pass them, and the king now didn't have the impetus to make them, and so nothing happened. Three years, and £160,000 had bought the Anglo-Irish nothing but a cause celebre, and celebre their cause they would, in time, all in good time. Falkland's government, now freed from the need to even pretend to tolerate non-conformity, issued a proclamation in April 1629 which ordered the dissolution of Catholic religious orders, and denied the legitimacy of Roman church hierarchies. 
A month later, Falkland claimed that this decree was being followed, almost to the letter, across Ireland. But in reality, Catholic clergy and organisations had plenty of experience resisting official suppression, and they operated relatively freely. In fact, the failure of the Graces posed far more of a danger to English rule in Ireland than simply as a lightning rod for Catholic dissatisfaction. As Professor Tyg O'Hanrakan covers in his fantastic chapter of the Oxford History of Ireland, Stuart policy towards Irish Catholics was both ineffective and self-defeating. The reversal over the Graces was just an extreme example of the differences in attitude between London and Dublin. The Dublin administration was regularly at odds with London over the extent of anti-Catholic policy. London often actively restrained Dublin desires to thoroughly persecute Catholicism, especially from the start of the negotiations for the Spanish match. Increasing toleration for Catholics and non-enforcement of penal laws had been one of the conditions of those discussions, and once they broke down, the question of Irish Catholic support took its place. This resulted in policy that was neither conciliatory nor ruthlessly effective. As we've covered, Catholics were largely marginalised from public office, which only increased the dominance of new English arrivals, while leaving the Catholic elite with significant resources which the new English administrators coveted. Unlike in England, where the monarch was physically present, the Irish had to deal with his representatives in the Dublin government and the Lord Deputy, who were often actively hostile. O'Hanra Khan further makes the comparison with the Habsburg lands in Central Europe, where conversion could be rewarded with political positions. In Ireland, these positions were not held out as incentives for the Anglo-Irish, or even the Gaelic Irish, to join the Church of Ireland. Instead, they were held for the new English. More proactive persecution was similarly ineffective. The recusancy fines most heavily affected the poor. The amount paid was a trifle for the elite, whether Anglo or Gaelic Irish, and they could negotiate their way around stronger punishments. Executions remained the ultimate punishment for non-conformity, as we can see in the executions in 1612 of Conor O'Devney, or Conhor O'Devney, and his fellow priest, Patrick Lochran or Podrick O'Lochran. Thank you to Joe from the 80 Days podcast for helping me with the pronunciations of the Gaelic names. Hopefully I haven't completely messed them up. O'Devney had been imprisoned since 1611, his protector, Hugh O'Neill, having famously fled a few years previously. On the orders of Lord Deputy Chichester, the octogenarian was condemned to death for treason. He faced the traitor's death, to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, and Chichester probably praised himself for making such a noteworthy example. An example was certainly made. O'Devney became a martyr, while the organisation of the Catholic Church in Ireland continued unabated. Similar failures followed the death of O'Devney's successor to the bishopric, Edmund Dungan, who died in custody. All this did was invigorate Ireland's Catholics to resist conversion, even had there been suitable rewards for doing so. The Graces could have brought Catholics inside the tent, removed some of the more egregious complaints, and opened the door to greater numbers of converts to the Church of Ireland. Instead, these complaints remained unaddressed. Worse, they had been agonisingly close to being addressed. We'll finish this episode by ending Falkland's tenure as Lord Deputy. The change in foreign policy circumstances also affected his political position. By this stage, Buckingham had been assassinated, which left Falkland without a protector in London. Falkland had enemies in Dublin and in London, and internal Irish politics unearthed evidence of official corruption. Falkland was a government minister, so of course he was corrupt, but without a powerful patron to bend the king's ear, his time in Ireland was numbered. So he was recalled to London in 1629 to face accusations in the infamous Star Chamber. Here, Falkland countered the accusations of his Irish enemies, and his own allies in Dublin 
forced the proceedings to drag out until March 1631, when it was finally decided to replace the Lord Deputy. His successor would become one of the principal figures in the outbreak of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, Thomas Wentworth, the first Earl of Strafford. But we'll get to him another time. For now, I have new members of the House of Lords to introduce to the realm. Rich Penny, Viscount Falmouth, Keith Dixon, Earl of Hampshire, Brent Sitz, Marcus of Queensbury, and the King's favourite himself, Andrew Shoemaker. Now I have a royal favourite to reward, and since I don't have land in Ireland to give away, I'm now looking into merchandise for Pax Britannica. A lot of people answered the survey to say they would consider buying some, and now I have a good reason to get that arranged. I'm imagining the usual podcast fare of mugs and bookmarks and pens, that kind of thing. Nothing groundbreaking, but little things you can buy to help support the show. I'll look into that over the next few weeks and update everyone in due course. Now, I can't finish up without saying something about current events. There's been a lot of things over the last few years which have been described as history in the making. If you're stuck for something to do, and you want to contribute to making the jobs of future historians easier, keep a journal or a diary about your experiences. I'm serious. The big picture decisions will be recorded everywhere, but it's everyday experiences, feelings, expectations, and all that. They're the interesting things. So if you can, and you feel at all interested in doing so, please do. Keep a little note, keep an account of things that are happening to you, to your family, to your friends, around your community. Those may seem really mundane, and in some ways they are, but they're also the most interesting things in history, and they're the things that make history thrive. So, make the most of this opportunity to be in someone's book 50, 100 years from now. But above all, stay safe, stay informed. It's all very well reading about interesting times, but it can be dangerous to live them. I hope you, your family, and your friends are safe, and remain safe until all of this blows over. As always, thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening.